Hi everyone, I am Nicole Weber, a Master of Public Health student from the University of Toronto. And I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, where we will have our panel of five experts share their insight on the Japanese school food program. Before we begin, I would like to note that I'm joining from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on this land. This gratitude extends to the insight we gained from today's webinar from our panelists as we work towards a school food program for Canada with federal investment in standards. We are looking to learn from other countries and understand the best practices so that we can design the best possible universal school food program for Canadian children and youth. So today's webinar is one of a series on school food programs around the world, sponsored by the Coalition for Healthy School Food, Food Secure Canada, George Brown College, and Toronto Metropolitan University Centre for Studies in Food Security. So far, we have featured school food programs in Brazil, Italy, Germany, Scotland, Denmark, and the US. This webinar featured, feature allows us to learn firsthand from school food leaders about the successes and challenges of school food programming in their countries. We hope to learn lessons from these webinars back to bring them back to our own federal government in the design of our hopefully soon to be announced federally funded school food program. Please note that this webinar is recorded and that the recording will be available on the coalition's website and YouTube channel. I would like to give special thanks to Savadra Dada Gupta and Amberly Roots for leading the design of this webinar series and to Gary Hoyer and his students at Georgia and College for the additional support. I will turn it over to Savadra to give an overview of how the webinar will proceed today. Thanks, Nicole. Um, hello, everyone. This is Shubhadra, a PhD candidate at the Department of Community Health and Epidemiology at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, so the duration of today's webinar is 90 minutes. We are going to start with roughly an hour of presentation from our four panelists, followed by 15 to 20 minutes question and answer period. So we encourage you to submit questions throughout the webinar today using the Q&A button. Um, in the bottom corner. We also encourage you to upvote the questions that you'd like to see answered. At the end of the session, Nicole and myself will select the top questions for our panelists to answer. And now I will turn it over to Nicole again to introduce the panelists for today. Thank you. Thank you, Subhadra. And now I have the pleasure to introduce our panelists. First, we will hear from Alexis and Liano Sanborn, who will give us an overview and origin of school food and food education in Japan. Alexis is an independent researcher, nature enthusiast, and award-winning artist. With over a decade of experience studying Japanese culture, she directed and produced Nourishing Japan, a documentary short which explores food education and the school lunch system in Japan. She received her bachelor's degree in East Asian Studies and Japanese from UC Santa Barbara, a master's in regional studies of East Asia from Harvard University, and a master's of public administration from New York University Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. Next, we will hear from Professor Rie Akamatsu to learn, to learn more about the funding and governance of the school food program in Japan. Professor Akamatsu is a registered dietitian, professor, and vice president of the affiliated library at Ochinamizu University in Tokyo. She pursued her interest in the transformation of eating behavior and health psychology during her master's at Kobe College, and then completed a doctorate in public health from Kyoto University focusing on the understanding of social determinants of healthy behavior. Her recent publications include researching the relationships between childhood education and adult food waste behaviors. And she has researched the impact of school-based cooking program on cook home cooking participation in Japan. Following this, Professor Betty Izumi will discuss how meals are organized at the schools and what they look like, along with a discussion on food waste. Professor Izumi's research focuses on issues at the intersection of nutrition, sustainability, and health equity. She uses a community-based participatory research approach to develop, implement, and evaluate interventions that aim to improve diet quality and health among the underserved populations while at the same time promoting vibrant 
and resilient local food systems. She has led research products focused on farm to school, farm to early care and education called Harvest for Healthy Kids, and a produce prescription program. During the 2017 17 to 18 academic year, she joined the Division of Natural Sciences at Ochinomizu University in Tokyo as a Fulbright Scholar. Together with her colleagues there and at Montana State University, she conducted an ethnographic study of the school lunch programs in Tokyo elementary schools. Lastly, we'll hear from Mayumi Majima Carr and Professor Katsura Omori about the basic law of shokuku, or food education, including an implementation example from Yamagata Prefecture and what lessons can be learned for Canada. Mayumi is the president for Table for Two USA, or TFT, a nonprofit organization that started in Japan with a mission to both tackle global hunger and health issues related to unhealthy eating. As the head of TFT in the United States, Mayumi has been leading two unique award-winning programs, Onigiri, Rice Ball Action, and Washokuku, Learn, Cook, Eat Japanese, in the US, and both featuring Japanese food culture to help tackle the critical health issues. The Washokuku program in particular responds to the gap in US kindergarten to grade 12 school systems where no current mandated food education curricula exists. Professor Katsura Omori, is a professor and researcher of nutrition education and health education at Yamagata University in Japan. She is interested in how food education can be integrated into the school lunch and school curriculum. Recent work includes researching the relationship between home economics education and achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And as well, she has researched international trends in food literacy and studies. She has contributed to the creation of a video on the structure and organization of the Japanese school lunch program, together with Dr. Rachel Angler Stringer from the University of Saskatchewan and Mayumi, whom I just introduced. Without further ado, I will turn it over to a video from Alexis to kick off today's webinar. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexis Aliano Sanborn, and it is my pleasure to be with you today. I'm an independent researcher of school lunch and food education in Japan, and have also produced a documentary film called Nourishing Japan. For today's presentation, I will be providing a background of school lunch. The focus of my presentation today will be a chronological exploration of school lunch and food education, grouped around four major themes, nutrition, identity, economy, and society. The four themes will help to contextualize the importance of school lunch beyond the classroom and in society. Before I begin, a note about terminology. Kyushoku or gakko kyushoku means school lunch and shokuiku means food education or nutrition education. I might occasionally switch between English and Japanese when describing these terms, so uh, this is an advance warning just in case that happens. School lunch began with the advent of universal education in Japan at the turn of the 20th century with the new Meiji government. This government sought to modernize according to the Western model. School lunches were not originally part of universal education, but developed organically through grassroots networks across the country. They were developed primarily with nutrition in mind to address hunger and food insecurity among impoverished school children. The earliest school lunch took place at Chuai Elementary School at Daitokuchi Buddhist Temple in Suruoka City, Yamagata Prefecture in 1889. Philanthropic monks provided simple, nutritious meals for their needy and hungry students. Their early meals were simple fare, for example, rice balls, pickled vegetables, and salted salmon. If you happen to visit Suruoka City, which also now happens to be a UNESCO gastronomic city, Daitokuji Temple exists to this day, and you can go visit and admire its commemorative tribute to school lunch in the courtyard. Over the following decades, school lunch developed steadily. In the 1930s, the Japanese government began to provide subsidies to cover school lunch operations, and the movement began to gain traction. Before the outbreak of World War II in 1941, school lunches could be found across the country. Even during the war, many schools continued to serve these meals. However, as the war deepened, meals became more and more meager, and in many places, by the end of the war, Kyushoku had stopped altogether. In the pre-war era, school lunch was established to provide nutrition and food to young persons. This was a movement that was government-supported. 
The focus on nutrition underpins the success and importance of school lunch to this day. Today, school lunch provides one third of a growing child's calories from a variety of nutritional sources. However, school lunch also began to take on other meanings than simply nutritional ones in the post-war era, among them a collective sense of identity and memory. In December 1945, the American occupational government began an experimental school lunch service in Tokyo for elementary school children. The US partnered with Japan's Ministry of Education, Ministry of Agriculture, and Ministry of Health and Welfare in this effort. At first, the program was limited to select schools in Tokyo and Yokohama, but by the end of the occupation in 1952, more than 8 million schools participated excuse me, more than 8 million children participated in this program. Occupation era school lunches also helped to cement school lunch service as part of the everyday life for Japanese students. And in 1956, the School Lunch Act was established, which my fellow presenters will discuss more about during their presentation. With the advent of the school lunch law, these daily meals became part of a national cultural identity. But the meals that were provided to the students were not necessarily like those that had been provided to the students at Dai Tokuji Temple. These meals included two key ingredients most Japanese people rarely ate before the war, bread and milk. School lunch now was becoming flavored with identity. Both bread and milk on the menu seem innocuous enough, but their inclusion was a form of Western soft powers and part of a broader cultural movement to embrace Western culture at that time. In the immediate aftermath of war, powdered milk was considered a great way for young people to get vitamins and minerals, as well as important fats. The milk was first donated by, donated by international organizations, later becoming produced by Japanese dairy farmers. Bread was more directly linked to the United States, which was experiencing a post-war wheat surplus. Wheat products such as bread and noodles in schools was a practical solution for the United States, and Japan was pressured to comply. In the 1950s and 1960s, Japan saw an increased consumption of meat, dairy, processed and fatty foods, a trend that continues to this day. The Japanese government began to take notice of these changes in diets and lifestyles throughout the decades and saw the importance that school lunch had in flavoring the nation. In the 1970s, the Health and Physical Education Council recommended that rice should replace wheat in school lunches in Japan, as Japan was experiencing a rice surplus. Rice is an important cultural marker of national identity and is a food considered, to quote Emiko Anuki Terni, the core of Japan's spiritual civilization. The 1970s also began an era of increased globalization and serving rice on the menu helped to preserve a sense of cultural identity, instilling in young persons a greater sense of the flavors of their country. Cultural identity began to take on even more important meanings throughout the 1990s and 2000s. As globalization continued, Japan was now competing against the world for the hearts and stomachs of the Japanese people. The change in diet and lifestyle contributed to rising cases of obesity, diabetes, and other non-communicable diseases. For example, between 1980 and 2000, obesity rates jumped from 17% to 28%. In response, the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare develops the National Promotion Movement in the 21st century, also known as Health Japan 21, to encourage healthier lifestyles. Beginning in 2000, local governments were charged with creating and implementing health improvement plans in their communities, and school lunch programs were seen as a way to mitigate these public health challenges. In 2005, the Basic Law on Food Education was established. This law was created to address several issues, including the health of Japanese citizens and supporting the domestic economy. The idea was that the more consumers knew about what they were eating, the better choices they would make. This includes knowledge of what constitutes a healthy diet, but also broader, more nationally relevant topics, such as awareness of traditional foods and supporting domestic agriculture. School Lunch too became a vehicle to help support the food education law when the school lunch law's aims were reworded and expanded in, in 2008. Now, through a new link with food education, school lunches became a way to intentionally support the local economy. 
Farmers and producers received subsidies from the government to develop meals at their local schools. And producers aim to have 30% of each, uh, to have at least 30% of each school meal sourced from local or domestic ingredients. Local producers and communities benefit from this relationship as it creates a sense of connection to people and place. Before I end my presentation, I would like to share with you a few visuals of school lunch and provide some specifics as to the meals themselves. Kyushoku is prepared fresh daily, either in-house at schools or at a school lunch center in town. School lunch fees for families are affordable and cover the cost of ingredients, while the local government covers costs for operations and labor. Meals have rigorous nutrition standards and feature seasonal, local, and heirloom ingredients, as well as special holiday dishes. Generally, most students nowadays enjoy the meals, finding them tasty and delicious. Students are encouraged to have relationships with those who prepare their food, an important teaching of food education, and to be mindful of where food comes from. Students acknowledge that they are part of a food cycle and are reminded to be grateful for their meals, for the meals themselves. Elementary school students receive food education lessons a few times a semester, covering topics from healthy diets to table manners. Some challenges do exist, such as preparing meals for those with allergies and dietary restrictions, and more recently, rising ingredient costs. But all in all, food education and school lunch is thriving in Japan. Lastly, I would like to share that in Japan, school lunch is a cherished part of collective memory and an, import, and an important part of society. School lunch is a professionalized industry. There are national school lunch competitions where prefectures compete for a prize. There are also school lunch restaurants and bars if adults want to experience the nostalgic flavors of, of youth. If you want to try to cook school lunch at home, there are even cookbooks. And school lunch features in anime and all sorts of mixed media. I hope that this presentation has helped to provide background as to the origins of school lunch and the multifaceted role that it carries. School lunch is indeed a great equalizer, helping to ensure proper nutrition and developmental growth. As our presenters will share, it is something that everyone is a part of and contributes to. School lunch is a way that students learn about the world around them, their society, and nature. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexis, for providing an excellent background on the Japanese school food program. And now I'd like to welcome Rie to provide us her, her uh, presentation now. Okay, thank you, Nico. I'm Ria Kamatsu from Tokyo, Japan. Thank you for giving me this opportunity today. I'm delighted to introduce the Japanese school lunch program. My part is on the governance and funding at school lunch. As shown here, there are many laws and guidelines to providing school lunch. The School Lunch Act is the law that is most involved in the implementation of school lunch. The School Education Act forms the basis of the school system. A diet nutrition teacher's license is based on this law. In addition, there are a basic law of Shokuiku and the Dietitians Act that are related to school lunch. Shokuiku means food and nutrition education and is a law that promotes shokuiku not only for ch children, but also all Japanese people. The Di Dietitians Act is a law written for the national license for a registered dietitian, which is a basic qualification of school dietitians or a diet nutrition teacher. Let me introduce the School Lunch Act. The School Lunch Act was enacted in 1954 after World War II. This picture was taken when the law was enacted. At that time, the main purpose of a school lunch was nutritional supplementation. Following World War II, many children were underweight and undernourished. Later, however, Japan entered a period of high economic growth. Our diet became richer and the purpose of the school lunch was changed. The, school, uh, the structure of the School Lunch Act has been revised several times, which is depicted here. It is divided into four chapters consist of 14 articles. This law provides for all that is fundamental to the operation of school lunch. 
The parts in green letters, 4, 5, 11, and 12, are the roles of the uh, Education Board and the national government. Expenses for school lunch management are depicted here. Article number eight in red is a school lunch nutritional standard. And number 10 is the implementation of shukuiku in schools. Article number one states the purpose of the school lunch. It says school lunch is a part of educational activities. Based on this purpose, there are seven goals in article number two. The first is to maintain and promote health through appropriate nutrition. And the second goal declares that school lunch improve not only health, but also children's eating habits. Therefore, shokuiku are conducted during school lunch hours. Third, it is written to foster a spirit of sociality and cooperation. In Japan, children prepare and clean up school lunches by themselves. This is a cultivate a spirit of cooperation. In addition, we believe eating with friends is important for sociality, although now they cannot eat together because of COVID-19. The fourth and fifth are the development of gratitude. Farming experiences or lecture from farmers are very popular at Shokuiku. Throughout these experiences, children learn gratitude for food. The photo on the right shows children learning about vegetables. The man is a farmer who came to the school and gave a lecture with a diet and nutrition teacher. The sixth is to cherish food culture. Therefore, it is recommended to use local products for school lunch. Visiting a rice field and plant Planting rice is also popular at Shokuiku. Lastly, number seven is about studying the food system through the school lunch. This photo shows the school lunch center, center. In Japan, some schools do not have school kitchens. In that case, children cannot know who made their school lunch or where it came from. Therefore, children visit the school lunch center as social studies. Let me move on the school lunch nutritional standards. This is based on Article 8. This is currently in use. School lunch nutritional standards are updated each time the dietary reference index for Japanese are updated. Diet and nutrition teachers or school dietitians create menus based on these standards. Article number 10 of chapter three describes shokuiku in schools. The guide indicates that each school should prepare an annual plan for shokuiku, such as when and what to teach throughout the year. In addition, the National curriculum standards state that shokuiku should be conducted in home economics, physical education, or such as social studies, science, and so on. For example, this is, uh, this is spaghetti made with soy-based meat. Before lunch, the children studied about the global environment in school, and during lunchtime, they ate soy-based meat meals. In this way, we establish a curriculum that links subjects and school lunch. Article four and five of chapter one describes the roles and responsibilities of Board of Education and the country. School lunch managed through the through local boards and of education, which come under the national government. Each board of education managed the local Mm, local schools. Each school has various committees, including the school lunch committee. Members of school lunch committee include not simply diet and nutrition teachers or school dietitians, but also teachers called school lunch chief. The school lunch committee discusses everything related to school lunches, such as children's food allergies, school kitchen facilities, and so on. 
the national and local governments bear some of the cost of school lunch, which is also included in School Lunch Act. Expenses related to school lunch can be broadly divided into four categories, labor cost, facility equipment cost, ingredient cost, and others. Labor and facility equipment and utility expenses are paid from national and municipal budgets. There are some opinions that school lunch should be free, but at present, most schools have pay, parents paid only for ingredients. This graph shows school lunch fee per meal by prefecture. According to this survey, the highest in two, uh, 282 yen in Niigata Prefecture. While the, the cheapest prefecture is Okinawa with 205 yen, and the national average is 250 yen. I have heard that recently school dietitians are struggling to make school lunches at this price due to the increased cost of ingredients. That concludes my presentation on the governance and funding of school lunch in Japan. In conclusion, I would like to introduce this journal, which captures that what I discussed today. It is written in English and open access, so I hope everyone can read it. Betty, the next speaker, also wrote an article in this journal issue. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rie, for sharing such insightful information about the acts and the goals involved in the school food program and for sharing the link to the special issue. I would like to now invite Betty to begin talking about what, how to implement the school food program in schools. Thanks, Nicole. I'm delighted to be here today participating in the Japan Food Program webinar. <clears throat> Five years ago, I had the opportunity to spend a year in Japan learning about their school lunch programs, both as a researcher and as a parent to two young children who were attending the local elementary school. So in my presentation today, I'll be sharing some of what I learned through these two experiences. School lunch participation rates in Japan are very high. 99.1% of elementary schools in the country provide school lunch and nearly all children participate. Most junior high schools also provide school lunch and about 80% of 12 to 15 year olds participate. With few exceptions, school lunches in Japan are prepared at a school lunch center or an on-site kitchen. More than half of all schools receive lunches from a school lunch center or a central kitchen facility. School lunch centers serve more than two schools and generally more than 1,500 students. As these photos illustrate, school lunch centers prepare meals from scratch. The center photo shows cooks boiling gobo or burdock root, which will later be marinated in a sweet soy sauce to make kinkira gobo, which is a popular side dish. The photo on the right shows cooks who are um, frying agapan, which is sometimes served as the carbohydrate in a meal and is a national favorite. Actually, um, local food, um, it, procuring local food is a priority for schools in Japan. And on average, school lunch centers procure about 28% of their food um, ingredients locally. And local food is generally defined as food that has been produced, harvested, raised um, within the geographic boundaries of the prefecture in which it's consumed. So 42% of schools have an on-site kitchen. In some cases, the on-site kitchen may be shared with a nearby school. So for example, if an elementary school and a junior high school are on the same campus, they may share an on-site kitchen. 
on-site kitchen generally provide meals for fewer than 550 students and on average procure about 24% of their ingredients locally. And this local food procurement rate really varies from prefecture to prefecture. On-site kitchens also prepare meals from scratch. And one advantage of having a kitchen on site is that students have more opportunities to engage with the school dietitian and the cooks than if their meals were prepared at an on-site on -site, uh, at a school lunch center. And this series of photos shows how sweet potatoes, which were peeled by students in a nutrition education class in the morning, were later used um, as a meal component for that day's lunch. Students generally eat lunch in their classrooms with their teachers. A small group of students rotate each week through school lunch toban. And the word toban means being on duty. So the school lunch, pro, school lunch toban group is responsible for retrieving the lunch cart, um, which contains the meal components, the serving and eating utensils and lunch trays from the on-site kitchen or the receiving area where meals from a school lunch center are delivered. The group also uh, sets up the serving line, serves lunch to their teacher and classmate, cleans up the lunch and returns lunch carts to the on-site kitchen or receiving area. And as an aside, it's worth mentioning that um, all of the um, school staff, including the principal, eat the same lunch as the students. The school lunch toban uniform is a gown, cap, mask, and gloves. Students take their uniforms home at the end of the week for washing and ironing, and then return it to the school the following week for the next group of students to use. And then while the school lunch toban group is setting up the lunch line, the rest of the class rearranges the uh, desks from rows into clusters of small groups and then lines up for lunch. And this, those were the pre-COVID, um, that was a pre-COVID routine. And, and as the pandemic um, subsides, um, schools are gradually returning to um, the pre-COVID scenario. Uh, the school lunch toban group serves each student and the teacher a portion of each menu item. The lunch cart contains just enough food for the students and their teacher to be safe this is served the same amount of food. School dietitians provide classrooms with a picture of the meal to help the toban group to serve the appropriate serving size. And school dietitians in Japan don't use cycle menus. Um, so the meals vary greatly from day to day. But a typical meal will include rice, bread, or noodles, a main dish, a side, milk, and soup. And so here we have rice, um, an egg, a baked egg and vegetable dish, a seaweed and vegetable salad, and a soup that contains strips of deep fried tofu and vegetables, and then also the milk. Uh, and then if there is fruit, it's served, um, it, it's eaten after the main meal as dessert. A meal accommodations are made for students with food allergies. They typically need a doctor's note um, and also for religious food restrictions and for students who are vegetarians. And this photo here was taken on the same day that the meal in the previous slide was served. And so when um, the school can't accommodate a student's dietary needs, the student can bring a meal from home. Students eat lunch in their classroom with their teacher, but occasionally the school dietitian, cooks, farmers, or other guests may join them. The second photo here um, shows a lunch cart with dirty trays, dishes, and utensils. Uneaten food is left in its serving container. At the end of the meal, school, students also break down and rinse their milk cartons and other packaging for recycling. And in the second photo, you can see students taking part in osoji or cleaning of their classroom, which is also part of their education. And in this case took place immediately after the lunch period. Eating with teachers has many benefits, um, but one of them is helping to minimize food waste, which helps to support sustainable development goals. School waste is measured and recorded daily, and nationally, less than 7% of food served is wasted. As a comparison, 
more than 30% of the food served in the US National School Lunch Program is thrown away. There are several ways in which teachers' lunchtime practices and their presence contributes to minimizing food waste. So first, although in theory, the school lunch Tolban group serves all of the students and the teachers the same portion of each meal component, in practice, some teachers allow students to request smaller or larger portions of each item, although they all do need to take at least a small portion of each item. And the photos here show what a small portion of a meal might look like in comparison to a regular portion. And this practice allows students to take the amount of food that is just right for them. Um, and then the theory is that they will be able to learn how to gauge their hunger and fullness and be able to finish all of the food on the tray. And to varying degrees, teachers also manage the distribution of leftovers by, for example, walking around the classroom and um, serving seconds to students. And then second, although school lunch is a time to socialize with friends and enjoy meals, too much socialization can result in students being unable to finish their meal within the allotted time, which is typically about 40 minutes, um, although this varies from school to school and from teacher to teacher. So sometimes teachers, especially who have younger children who might take longer to eat their meals or get through the lunch line, they'll set a timer for mogu mogu time, which is a short period of time when students eat mindfully in silence. And then finally, teachers promote food gratitude through meal rituals. At the beginning of the meal, the class will put their palms together and say in unison, itadakimasu, um, or I humbly receive. And then after eating, they'll again put their palms together and say gochisousama, or it was a feast. Eating without waste and returning a tidy lunch cart are signs of appreciation for the food and the labor involved in preparing the meal. And food gratitude is tightly tied to the concept of motanai, which is a deeply ingrained social norm to respect resources, food, skills, natural resources, and so on, um, and to use them to their fullest potential. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your interest in Japan's school lunch program. Thank you, Betty. That was so great to hear and learn about uh, just hearing more about the school lunch Tobin group and how that works, as well as a lot of discussion about uh, food gratitude and listening to hunger and fullness cues. So thank you very much. And now I'd like to welcome, um, sharing the floor a bit, is Mayumi and Katsura, who will be discussing the food education or shokyuku. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. So I'm Mayumi Wejimaka from Table for Two. Uh, today I'm joining from San Diego, California, USA. And then with uh, Professor Omori, we would like to talk about food education in Japan. So first I'm gonna introduce the food education law in Japan. And Professor Omori is gonna show how uh, practically it's gonna work and then introduce the example in Yamagata. And at the end, I'm gonna introduce the example to bring the Japanese food education to abroad here in the US. So the, there's a basic law of Shokuiku that's a very unique law focusing on food education in Japan. So that was enacted in 2005. Um, there was a um, variety of concerns about food and nutrition issues in Japan. So this law uh, states that food and nutrition plays the most important role in children's cultivation of humanity and acquisition of life skills. And also it said uh, food education is a basis of human life and it's a fundament the fundamental education to the, all the other education. And it's also said, especially it's important for children. And as you can see that uh, Japan puts very high priority on food education. And also this uh, shokuiku law consists of the following components like various um, uh, field and uh, it's promote health in body and mind, but also um, it promotes uh, the understanding of greater appreciation uh, to a natural environment and the people and appreciation to a traditional Japanese food culture, food supply demonstration. So, 
as you see that this law is a very comprehensive approach, like uh, not just about nutrition, but it promoting to teach about food very broadly. And this one illustrates the Shokuik policy promotion system. So as you can see, the federal government uh, set the direction and then also local government have a more detailed planning and implement. And various like stakeholders, not just schools, but the people in the community are part of this um, promotion of Shokuiku. So now um, Professor Omori is gonna talk how uh, this uh, works and especially in Yamagata. Okay. And Mayumi-san controls, will control my slide for me. So I say you the, the next slide. It's okay. And Yamagata located in northern part of Japan is a typical agriculture prefecture where high quality rice and fruits is produced. Also the first nation school lunch were established here in 8089. Based on these local characteristics, Yamagata has promoted food education along with another movement regarding local production for local consumption called, we call Chisan Show. This is a homepage for Delicious Yamagata Promotion Group, which worked in the Prefectural Dep Department of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries. The, you can see the special mountain logo, shaped, uh, shaped mountain logo uh, called Peloni on the left side. And the student can see this logo everywhere. And uh, that means uh, by local. And uh, this is a tofu, push the bottom. Uh, this is a tofu in the refrigerator. And uh, you can see the peroline mark on it, the push the bottom. That's a small green mountain shape. In this presentation, I would like to share the, some Yamagata practice with you as an example of collaboration of school lunch and food education in rural area of Japan. Next slide, please. Here, this table shows how many schools in Yamagata attend the school lunch system, different to the national data. Generally, less junior high schools serve lunch than elementary schools. However, in Yamagata, still high percentage, more than 95 percentage of junior high schools attend to the school lunch system. Next slide, please. The government has encouraged using locally grown food for school lunch. National average is 26 percentage in red number. And this table is the ranking about the percentage of its usage. Some prefecture in southern part of Japan, like Yamaguchi, Okayama, Tokushima, Shimane, uh, the highest the percentage. And also Hokkaido is a big agriculture prefecture where it's located in the northern part of northern end of Japan. And some prefecture which have metropolitan cities such as Tokyo and Kanagawa, Osaka, Kyoto show the low, lower number. Yamagata located in the middle and still we might have something to do for increasing this percentage. Next slide, please. This might be the highlighting slide for my presentation. And I would like to explain about prefectural support to promote the local production for local consumption in school lunch. There have been two main projects on the left side. The project one is a subsidy for school activities which invite local farmers into the classroom to eat lunch together and interact with the students. The second project the number two is a subsidy for school lunch, which use locally grown vegetables, processed food, and rice bread instead of wheat bread. You have to implement the project one, the interaction with the local farmers. If you want to get the subsidy for the project two, the uses of local products. Yamagata on the bottom, Yamagata set the goal about the percentage of the school, which has implemented the event Interact, interacted with local farmers. All schools in Yamagata have been required to do so by 2024, while 
currently 30% of public schools already have completed the inter international launch. Next slide, please. Let's move to the Japanese uh, public education system. And the Japanese children enter the elementary school at age six of the first graders and the curriculum lasts six years. By this table, you can grasp whole curriculum and allocation of the class hours. The students grow vegetables in living environment like green worm, living environment studies class at the first and the second grade. From the third grade, science and social studies begin and they learn how plants grow and about the agriculture industry in our country. Now in yellow line, the home economics class starts from sixth grade and both boys and girls uh, learn practical lessons in being green and ethical consumers as well as cooking. And push the bottom please. And the, the Japanese school and system as already people are told, has a significant role of providing not only the nutrition meal every day, but also many opportunities of food education, pertaining to production, distribution, consumptions, and disposal, as well as tradition of food. Next slide, please. This is a lunchtime at the elementary school attached to the, my Yamagata University. Here is Betty, when she visited my place, Yamagata, do you remember? <laughs> the student enjoyed the lunch with her in the classroom. The menu on that day contained the purple chrysanthemum and green edamame, which were both popular local products in Yamagata. Also, these are good example. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Served <laughs> at this same school. The uh, left side, Setsubun is a famous traditional event in winter and people play for the happy spring coming at the end of the winter. Sardine and a small package of roasted soybeans were served. And the uh, right, side, uh, right side, on the other day, the student could enjoy the special menu using tsuyahime, the local high quality brown rice with fish and many vegetables as side dishes. The next slide, please. I would like to insist that everyday menu could work as a real learning material about balanced diet for the student. The monthly school letter is distributed from school to home. And also this is usually posted in the each classroom so that both parents and home room teachers can share the information of what kind of ingredients are used in today's menu. As you can see on the top, the date, the name of the today's menu and the calories. And push the bottom, please. And uh, the significant characteristics of this letter is information about the three color groups of food. This grouping system classified food into the three groups. Very simple, very simple system. And yellow group contains good source of carbohydrate. And the red group has good source of protein. And green group is good source of vitamins and minerals. I think this material might contribute to the student's better understanding about balanced diets as everyday routine for six years. Next slide, please. In addition, I'd like to inform the important role of home economics as food education in Japan. This is a textbook for the elementary school. And uh, national curriculum requires them to learn how to cook rice and miso soup as traditional dishes in our country. Next slide, please. Also, a social studies classes is another good chance to learn about food, local food production. This is a unique, call, unique activity called Bistoro Gesuido, aiming to use the resources from municipal wastewater and its treatment for agriculture at the Tsuruoka Wastewater Treatment Plant in Yamagata. It has just started to use leafy vegetables produced by this project for the local school lunch. I and my colleagues work together to develop new learning program. Next slide, please, for fifth graders in social studies uh, last year. Next slide, please. We plan the, uh, the students uh, tasted the solid, solid and uh, touching the solid. And the next 
bottom, please. <coughs> and we plan the collaboration of this program with School Lunch for promoting sustainable eating in our society. Next bottom, please. And we have the guest speaker. Next bottom, please. From the Faculty of Agriculture, and uh, the student uh, mm -hmm. give that question to the professor. And the next bottom, please. And the next slide. Thank you. Uh, last some slides show I and my university student visited the local kindergarten to provide food education. The bottom, please. This kindergarten has garden and where they grow and harvest summer vegetables and chestnuts, sweet potatoes, daikon radish, and so on. Next slide, please. University students cook and serve a healthy snacks after teaching about food in classroom. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. Yes, they provide food education in front of the children. Next bottom, please. I think that's all. And we enjoy this activity so much with the university student. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Omoni Sensei. Oh. Uh, and uh, just a list, just a go ahead. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Now, at the end, I would like to show an example of how to take lesson learned and apply abroad, and especially to introduce the Japanese inspired food education program here in the US. So, first, like Table 42 is the organization that I belong to, is a nonprofit organization and studied in Japan and uh, became um, globally. And then we promote healthy eating. And also we provide healthy school meals to children in need around the world. So to promote healthy eating as part of our missions, we developed this uh, Japanese inspired food education program. So it's called Wa Shokuiku. This is a combination of two Japanese words. One is um, Wa Shoku means Japanese food. Second one is Shokuiku means food education. And so our goal is to teach American students like about healthy eating through Japanese food angle. So background in the US was that there were some um, challenges that childhood obesity has been soaring in the US and also limited healthy food consumed among children. A lot of calories were from actually like ultra processed food. And also at school level, very limited food education opportunities. So ideally there's a 40 to 80 hours per year, uh, nutrition education hours, but uh, reality was um, about only seven hours per year uh, food education time for students. And why we took this Japanese approach, uh, there's three reasons that, one is that Japanese food is like recognized as one of the healthy diets. But also important thing is that here in the US, uh, Japanese food is very popular, maybe thanks to sushi and ramen, but it's important that students are interested in and get engaged for the effectiveness food education. So that's why we thought this approach might be good. And also we are inspired by the basic law of Shokuiku, which is um, promoting um, you know, um, very comprehensive way to teach about food. So we wanted to bring that concept. And also we want to teach about practical and tasty way of cooking. So many schools in Japan, like focusing on teaching students and it's not just about cutting, but you know, still frying, grilling, boiling. So that's very practical and I think critical to continue like healthy eating throughout their life. So that's why we wanted to bring that as well. So the, this program has three focuses. First is to teach about Japanese food knowledge, like how to prepare tasty and healthy dishes. <clears throat> Second one is to teach about manners and custom. I talk about like appreciation toward food and people. And also we talk about <clears throat> food related issues like food waste and what action like students can take. So class model is like, we have like different topic and start with like 10 to 15 minutes presentation about that topic, including nutrition um, and learn about that food itself. And 
we bring a very portable, like uh, simple cooking equipment and students can actually cook a few recipes in the classroom. And of course they enjoy eating. And here's a sample of lessons we have and we have maybe 20 lessons. And then um, for the recipes, so we are trying to use the easily available ingredients at regular grocery stores so that students can actually practice at home. So that it ranges like rice bowl to miso soup and healthy ramen to bento. So, so many Japanese food um, students can make <clears throat> during this class. We also teach about like useful Japanese food culture and concepts, like five colors to uh, teach about balanced meals. And hara hachibu means uh, it's important uh, eat to eat 80% full. And itadakimasu is the word uh, to show appreciation toward food itself and people. And motaina, I think Betsy mentioned, that uh, means what a waste. But we read a funny book called Motaina Grandma and talk about this food waste and what they can do not to motaina. So I want to show the, how the program looks like uh, with a um, one minute video. Shokuik has three focuses. The first one is we teach how to make healthy Japanese food and also ingredients are like available in at most of the grocery stores. So that means that you can actually try at home. And every time they get bento box, like little Japanese style box, and then they put the prepared food uh, into the little bento box and using chopsticks and then they kind of experience like balanced meal with small portion. So another focus is learning about food cultures. <laughs> and lastly, they learn about food uh, related issues and what action they can make. So one thing they learn is food waste and the word multi-nai means uh, some of the Japanese concept that not being wasteful. I love washoko iku. I like learning how to make different kinds of food. Okay, so that's how the program looks like. So we've been providing to over 10,000 students in, and we've been evaluating the effectiveness through pre and post surveys and see um, the impact. So more students can identify balanced meal after the program and they more students understand uh, the importance of not overeating. And <clears throat> good thing is 96% of the students want to practice the cooking skill at home. So there are a few learnings through this experience. The first one is that you know, Japanese food angle and the uh, like comprehensive approach like Shokui Glow states actually increase student engagement and understanding in food like overall. And second, uh, it's important to integrate to classroom. So in the US, there's no home economics, but we learned that some of the existing curriculum like health science and social studies we can integrate that food education program. And the important thing is that teachers are already busy with the existing subjects. So it's better, it's important to provide like additional resources, uh, like stuffing, because especially to do like cooking, uh, it's a lot of work. So uh, it's always a challenge, but better to have like additional resource. And funding, and we studied uh, by getting fun, uh, funding from foundation, corporation, and school budget. But of course, uh, ideally, it's important to get government um, funding, uh, national level, local level. But we experienced like, you know, sometimes there's a not stable funding. Some years, like, you know, much, a lot, some year not. So I think it's important to have maybe long-term commitment for the food programs. 
So that's the overview of food education in Japan and hope this helps to develop a great program in Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Mayumi and Katsura. That was uh, great to see both. Um, there's just so much to learn and just from how food education is prioritized and how it's comprehensive. Uh, and the example from Yamagata Prefecture was really good to see how it was in put it across the subjects. So thank you very much for that insight. And now we are moving on to the Q&A portion, but um, I definitely, I want to thank all of our five panelists um, for the very informative presentations. Um, honestly, it was so great to learn about the organizations and the activities of school food program and food education in Japan. And I think honestly, we have lots to learn from you here in Canada. And so the Q&A period will be about, um, about 20 minutes or 25 minutes maybe. Um, as mentioned earlier, we encourage you to send in your questions through the, the Q&A or the chat box um, and we can see which ones will have our panelists answer. But to get everything started, I will go over to Savadra because I think she has a couple of questions to ask everyone. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you everyone for your amazing presentations. All of them are so informative and just really give so much information. Um, so I have a couple of questions on the subsidy. So first of all, I understand uh, that the prefecture government provides subsidy, but I think the federal government also provides subsidies. So how how are those two different types of subsidy works? Like, uh, what are the what are the difference between them? Like, what is which one is given to whom, and also what percentage is given as su subsidy, and and that percentage, like which school is getting what percentage or which producer is getting which percentage? How is that decided? Thank you. That question to me? So it's like an open <laughs> question. Uh, so anybody can yeah. answer. Yeah, I, so sorry, I don't have um, exact now replies about the um, subsidies, but uh, I know that every, every year, each municipal go government applies to the country uh, municipal okay. government uh, manage the local schools and the uh, municipal government applies to the uh, national government and the national government support half of the budget okay uh. so half of the budget of the municipal governments in yeah. for the school food programs yes half is municipal budget and the half is the national government okay okay uh. yeah Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Svadra. And I think we had an earlier question as well about when considering this is something that um, I noticed in my research as well is that um, are there any dietary requirements such as like allergies or religious needs that are taking into account when making the meal at the schools? This can be a question to anyone. From what I've studied, um, I think it, it depends on, on communities um, and each, certainly each, um, you know, municipality uh, is informed of those students who have uh, dietary restrictions due to religious or, um, you know, out food allergies. Um, but I think um, I've I've read some articles where where there are lots of immigrants from perhaps Southeast Asia and there's um, a lot of sort of halal traditions in cooking and the school lunch um, service providers are developing recipes with that in mind um, to help um, you know serve the needs of that local population so that school lunch can be something. Uh, that everyone can can participate in, but from what I've from what I've read so far, um, it seems like it's on sort of a case by case basis. I want to share my experience. Like my kids also go to Japan uh, school in Japan. There's a teacher, like nutrition, you know, teacher. So they are like you know, they have a like, meeting with parents and learn all about allergy and made like customized menu for the students with food allergy. I think that's, you know, in Japan, they put like 
those you know, teacher focusing on that area and then provide that kind of special service. I think that was great. And in Yamagata, I know the, they have the, they prepared a special meal, uh, removing the egg, egg because of, egg is the, because of the biggest food with the food allergy. So they prepare the special menu for the kids with the egg food allergies. So I have a question on uh, funding. Um, so in terms of funding, does the national government has any specific um, amount that is given to the schools or in this entire school food sector every year? Or it kind of fluctuates every year depending upon the need or the situation or the context? I, uh, it, it's very difficult to support all, all needs from the all over the Japan. So I so, sorry I don't know how they they decide uh, to sub support. Uh, Katsura, do you know about that? I'm sorry, I don't have any information about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing your insight on that. And we have a few questions in the chat I'll ask. Um, Gary asks, do school meals and food education continue beyond junior high school? Um, I would just uh, jump in to say food education, um, in the context of today's presentation, we're looking at it through the school perspective, but it's, a, it's actually a nationwide movement that um, all members of Japanese society are encouraged to participate in. So there is food education in a classroom setting, but then there's also food education in um, a community setting. So, um, uh, you know, parents can go to, to different types of, um, you know, cooking activities, harvesting activities, uh, different things like that. So even um even if formal classes and formal lessons um you know come to an end for a student um there's still ways for them to engage with food education in their local communities um, through volunteer uh, uh support so i wonder katsura you might know home economics maybe at high school is like pre Quite a lot of high school have home economics and have cooking programs. Yeah, still in high school, still it's a mandatory subject. So all boys and boys at the even senior high school, they learn how to cook. My son now is uh, located, uh, the belonging to the high school and uh, he learned how to cook in classroom. That's great to hear. And that's something um, I myself taught in a Japanese high school and got to experience uh, the, cooking, the cooking schools there as well. So um, it was uh, great to see. Um, we also see, I have a question from Kirsty. Um, wondering if there are supports for families who cannot afford um, the cost of the, the school meal and what that support would look like. Yeah, it depends on municipality. <laughs> Sometimes some some per, some area support uh, the school meals fee instead of parents, mm, but it depends on the municipality. Also, I think local government will support the poor family not only for the school meal but for the everything like. You can buy the like notes or the clothing with the support from the government, not only for the school lunch, I think. Yeah, um, it, it, you know, like in the US, um, lower income families can apply for free or reduced price meals. Yeah, and like a special meal card? Yeah, it's not a meal card anymore, but yes, that, that, that idea. But in Japan, it's more the family gets um, resources from the government, so money, and like um, Katsura said, that money can be used for whatever the family 
exactly. know, is necessary to purchase because in going to, yeah going to school in Japan actually there's a lot of things that students need to purchase they need to purchase special indoor shoes and their you know gym uniform etc so they um so lower income you you, you apply for that kind of support and uh, the family chooses how they want to use that. So anyway, all families has to pay at first for the school lunch. Mm -hmm. But maybe after you can get the support from the mm -hmm. government. Right. And I and um, I also just wanted to mention that um, in my experience, and I, I know that things vary from prefecture to prefecture and schools, et cetera. But um, in my experience, the money was just directly withdrawn from my bank account. Mm -hmm, that's um, right. so, that, so money comes to the family, uh, families who are low income into their bank account, and then the school would with withdraw money from that bank account. You have to submit the uh, paperwork about uh, your salaries and uh, so on. Great, thank you. And I, I believe, um, was it, um, Rie mentioned that there was some discussion of um, universal free program or was that, is that something being discussed right now in the government? Can, can you say, say again, this universal? <clears throat> yeah, did you mention um, something about um, a free school meal for, for all students? Is that something that's being discussed by the, the government or? Because um, I know you mentioned that um, uh, free school, uh, free meal. The free meal instead of paying, the parents pay the so the cost of the ingredients. So I thought I, I heard something about um, not paying for the parents for, to not pay the cost of the ingredients. Like a, yes, a free. some local areas start to support uh, school meals free, free, but not not as a popular, still not popular. Uh, yeah, it's it cost four thousand yen, about forty dollars, uh, per month. Parents pay every month. So more of a prefecture decision right now. Yeah, yeah, yes, that's right. And you mentioned that uh, the dietitians are having a hard time making the meal plan with the amount of money right now, is that something that they will have to, is that amount going to change then because food is more expensive or? Yeah, I think so. So the, the school meal fees is a difference in the, uh, by the prefecture. Uh, so some schools increase the fee. Uh, Thank you for sharing insight on that. Um, Mayumi, I have a question. You mentioned about resources because you said teachers are very busy. So having the food education integrated across subjects um, that are already being taught. But I'm wondering in Japan, who creates the resources for teachers to use for food education? You mean materials or the who teaches or? Uh, yes, the teaches the materials. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, Japan has trying to promote like having nutrition education teacher like more. And that's the idea, you know, there's a you know teacher really teaching nutrition and then um, making all the materials and actual teaching. But I think uh, it's, there's a challenge also in Japan, like, you know, not everywhere, you know, enough, but I think at least, you know, the government is promoting to having like additional special teachers focusing on that. I think that's a you know, great direction. One thing I just wanted to mention is um, there's that, that I think Japan does really well is integrating the school, the rest of the school curriculum with school lunch. And so, you know, they're, they're like across the entire country, all I think fifth graders learn about rice and how to grow rice and, you know, 
harvested and they go through that whole process it's not part of the you know the school lunch education per se but it's a you know this but the kids are eating rice in in school lunch and then in social studies you know other teachers are also contributing to what to that food education so um I think that you know and then the dietitian is also supporting that so that helps to kind of spread the workload a bit it's not just solely on the diet and nutrition teacher to be responsible for preparing all of the materials about food and nutrition education great thank you for the insight on that it towards some experiential learning um that's very key yes um kirstie you have a question i see your hand yeah, I do. Thank you. So first of all, just thank you so much to everyone. This has just been fascinating. So interesting um, hearing about this. Um, and I had spent some time in Japan, but before this program had started. So it's so interesting to hear now what's been happening. Um, my question is, um, has there been or, or is there currently any resistance ever from society um, towards the government, the national and maybe I guess prefecture governments contributing to this program or resistance around the school providing the, the meal rather than the family providing the meal? Um, I don't know of anything recently, so I'm going to uh, wait for my Japanese colleagues to to jump in if they if they know of anything specifically. But for for myself, um, Kind of like how I mentioned in my presentation, I think that school lunch has really become something that is incredibly valued um, by families because it, it really helps to um, alleviate the, the burden placed on families to prepare meals every day. Um, so many um, mothers especially uh, really value uh, not having um, knowing that what they their child is receiving is not only prepared fresh and and can help to um, you know teach about various food cultures, but that it's really nutritionally balanced. So, you know, I think um, I would say generally they are they are well received and um, and thought of as a very important part in Japanese society. But I'm sure that there are um, you know there occasionally I've read stories about you know. The food quality at one of one town is not good, um, and there's um, sort of you know com community outrage or something like that. But um, my impression is that uh, as a whole, um, it is it is almost expected now that um, school lunch is something that the government supports and that is part of uh, daily Japanese people's lives. I and Alexis discussed about this issue before. And uh, I would like to add it the uh, uh, currently like private consignment and uh, consolidation has been considered to save the cost, but also it also might cause quality degradation. So it's an argument issue, I think. Um, also in terms of like, food education part, so in Japan, uh, as the law said, food education is kind of fundamental education. And then most of the Japanese people, when they heard the word food education, shokuiku, they think, oh, that's important. You know, the school should teach about food at school. Uh, nobody resists about that. But I think outside of Japan, like in the US, more like food is something more like, you know, private, you know, family, you know, it's gonna take care of it. So I, I've seen the big gap uh, in Japan and here in the US, how you know people think about like food, you know, education, especially at schools. Do you, you mean the the Korean people don't care about food compared to the Japanese people? Mm, more like um, they think that food is their like personal choice, you know, that like not something you know students should learn at school. More like I, I think more like personal thing that that's no more people might think that way. Um. I think also because the nutrition standards in Japan are so rigorous for each meal that it really, um, whereas in other countries, um, perhaps people might prefer to bring their own lunches from home because the, the nutrition is so um, 
uh, at a high level that um, it's it's something that is easy to kind of uh, incorporate into your lives and to, and to rely on uh, for the development of your child. Thank you everyone for your time and the amazing answers that you provided and insight um, into the Japanese school food program. And I want to just say, um, yes, just such appreciation for your participation. Um, and as mentioned earlier, this, this webinar is a, a part of a, a school food program around the world, uh, Lessons for Canada. Uh, webinar series, um, and that actually the yes, yeah, uh, which GUSAP will also have the link for in the chat box, and the recording will be made available on our website as soon as possible. Um, so again, thank you everyone for your attendance and participation, and thanks to our panelists uh, for your insight, and to Roger Gustav and the team for putting all this together. Um, we appreciate your attendance. Thank you, Gustav. Great. Thank you, everyone.